Hello, and welcome back to the Common Connected Podcast. I'm your host, Janine Halloran, and on today's podcast, I get a chance to speak with Jean-Marie Paynell, who is a parenting mentor, a Montessori home consultant, and a doula. So she also hosts the Art of Parenting podcast, and she has founded a business called Your Parenting Mentor, where she guides expectant parents, caregivers, and parents of young children to better prepare their homes and themselves for their children to thrive during their first six crucial years of life. So she really focuses especially on Montessori and positive discipline, conscious parenting. And we had a lovely conversation all about the Montessori um, way of working with children and of raising children. So we talk a lot about what a Montessori, um, the Montessori philosophy is, but then also what it can look like at home. And what are the red flags that you should be looking out for if you're looking for a Montessori school? And if you notice these things, that's not actually a Montessori school. So I hope you enjoy. Jean-Marie, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Oh, it's an honor. Thank you so much. And I, I was actually thinking this morning how I love the title of your podcast, <laughs> Calm and Connected. To me, it's like, that's what we all want to be, right? And especially as parents. So beautiful. And and I love all your practical tips and interviews. So it's an honor to be here. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. It actually was one of the things when I was brainstorming with my husband slash business partner about the podcast, I wanted, I that's what I wanted to communicate. Like we we should exude some calm so we can yeah. set the tone and we need to connect. We need to connect with one another. We need to connect with our kids. We need to connect with other people. So I'm, I'm so glad that that is coming through. Yes. Yes. No, that resonates beautifully. So for people who don't know you, can you just give us a little bit of your background and who you are? Sure. So I am Jeanne-Marie Penel. I am a parenting mentor and um, as I was starting to share offline, I kind of found my calling later in life, and I haven't looked back, and I basically um, am a Montessori and positive discipline kind of parenting expert, and I like blending the two. They're both, uh, you know, philosophies and principles that I think are right on for understanding children, for understanding human development, really, and to stay calm and connected. So that is that is where my passion lies. Um, I'm also the host of The Art of Parenting, uh, where I've had the honor to have you on. And, uh, and uh, what else? That's, I think that's about it right now is, is I'm focused on my podcast, and then uh, mentoring families, I also do uh, home consultations and school consultations for those who maybe want to understand Montessori better and bring it into their homes or their schools. For example, these days, I've been working on this uh, gorgeous idea that is a co working space with childcare. So you go to work with your children and your children are in the room next door. And if you're still breastfeeding, you can take a break and go see them. They take breaks and have lunch together. And it just it's just beautiful. So I've been kind of mentoring the the teachers there and setting up the environment. So anything that has to do with Montessori environment and all that is my happy place. Oh, my gosh. Uh, You know, when I was a parent of little ones I would have I would have gone to that immediately if I could have had my kids at school with me so I could go and see them when I needed to it would have been a different experience right completely completely I was actually there yesterday and I was observing like at, at they all take a lunch break together and the parents come and get the children um you know from the playground and then go have lunch and it just It just was so beautiful because the parents are connecting together and the children are with their parents and the teachers get a break. And it was just like, it just all made sense. And then they go back and have a nap and, you know, mom and dad go back to work and you're there on the same, you know, physical location. So it's really nice. Oh my goodness. What a beautiful way of being able to still be that person where you're out and you're doing things and you're being the adult, but then you also can still do the parenting thing that is exactly. part of who you yeah. are. Yeah. Oh, 
So I've had people on before uh, where we've talked about positive uh, parenting. Um, and so I've had Sarah Moore on, I've talked to Nicole Schwartz about that, but I haven't had anybody talk about Montessori. So, oh, okay. I know. So you're the first <laughs> one, right? And I, I, rem- I read, um, a, a, I think, um, about Maria Montessori several years ago, and I was fascinated. And I mm. had younger kids at the time. And so I was looking at different kinds of schools that mm-hmm. would be good for them and might be something that I wanted to explore. We ended up not going down that route. But for people who don't know anything about Montessori, can you share a little bit about what the philosophy sure. is? And- sure, 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 sure. <laughs> so first of all, we have to know that Montessori is a proper name. It was was Dr. Maria Montessori. Um, more than 150 years ago, she was born. And uh, Maria was one of the first European women allowed to go to medical school. So she was kind of a, you know, feminist before her time, a, a precursor. She actually was quite a feminist because she she ended up doing a lot of work to protect uh, women's rights, especially mother's rights, and then children's rights. She really was very involved in understanding and helping us understand human development. Before Dr. uh, Montessori, I think we We all believe that children were born as these empty slates and that, you know, it was our responsibility to fill them up with knowledge and that they were, you know, kind of useless until they could talk and write or whatever. We now know that is quite the contrary, right? (laughs) They are born like ready to learn and just, you know, so curious and and the, the brain that is existing and that is developing those first six years is just so powerful like it it is more powerful than than you know plenty of adult brains together so she really helped us understand that and this was before brain scans or anything all of this is now being you know proven right so for me she was a genius before her time very you know, very knowledgeable, very intuitive. And, you know, she, she, in one of her uh, biographies, you know, she clearly says, I, I didn't mean to create a method, I was just looking at the child. So don't look at me, look at the child, right? It's really by observation. And we as Montessori guides, so we're not called teachers, we're called guides, we are trained to observe. Observation is like the most important tool to help us understand the child and really um, help us understand what they're interested in. Because contrary to conventional education, Montessori is child-driven. It is really this understanding that we are all born with a really very strong need to to learn to adapt we're we're curious we we want to be able to do things for ourselves independence is very important so as guides we set up the environment we call this a prepared environment and depending on the age group the environment's going to look a little different and we really uh connect the child to the work that is there so that they become very calm uh, and connected to the to the work. And this helps them have that sense of, of, of calm and, and self-discipline and so forth. There, there's actually a term that I'm not crazy about the, 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 the word itself, but the concept is beautiful. And she calls this a normalized child meaning that the child that is permitted to choose the work that they want, right? That that following their interests, that are, they are left alone to repeat as many times as they need to, and that they are, you know, never interrupted when they are in their flow and concentrated. They become calm and and generous and kind and they are what we call the normalized child that is their normal state when we respect 
those needs. So that's in a nutshell that there's other little important points that I can go into about the difference with uh, conventional education. Would you like me to go into those a little bit? Yeah, that would be great. Okay. So people okay. understand what that looks like. Cause it is right. Different. Right. Walking so, into a so, story school looks very different. <laughs> very different. And, and most people that go and, and observe in a Montessori school will say, Oh my gosh, it's so quiet. It's so calm. Everybody is so focused. And that is because we give them the freedom of choice. So they choose, and it's really trusting that the child knows what they need to adapt to their time, place, and culture, right? So we are trusting that human development. And so for one, you know, so I said child-driven there's this notion of the prepared environment. And so Montessori, I think, you know, just to backtrack a little bit, I think Montessori is often associated with preschool. Yes. But um, for me, it starts at conception. It really is, you know, a, a, an understanding of human development and so forth. And it actually goes through adolescence. There is uh, what we call the nido, the nest, which is approximately eight weeks uh, where we can welcome children and then through the adolescent program. So it is not only preschool, it, it really goes through and she really you know, developed uh, herself and with her son a, a whole curriculum for, for the entire span of those first um, 18 years. So to, to just go back, so there is the child-driven, there's this notion of we're preparing the environment. So all those environments are going to look very different depending on the stage of development that our children are, especially, uh, you know, intellectually, but emotional, uh, social, and so forth. Um, I only worked in a two and a half to six-year-old classroom. And that is also very different from our conventional classrooms is there are mixed ages, right? Yeah. Just yeah. like society, just, just like home. Right. And it's one of those things, mixed ages actually really does help developmentally, self-regulation wise, kids who are older, who can be leaders for the younger ones. It's amazing to have inter, inter uh, it is. age. And exactly. <laughs> and I, and I always tell, you know, I always say like, would you really want to only work with people your age? No. Like, how boring would that be, right? <laughs> we wouldn't be having this conversation, right? Exactly. So it's that intergenerational uh, concept and, and just the family concept. And you're right, like to see, to witness the child that has been there for three years. So I, I, I had them for three years, but that third year child, oh my goodness, they they blossom, they become confident, they get to show around what they know, and they get to practice, you know, the these lessons that they've, they've, they've mastered and, and help the younger ones and the younger ones get to have this notion of I'll get to do this one day, right? Because it's already all laid out on the shelves, everything for the three years. And so we have this idea of limit and order. So also, you know, I think there's a misconception that people say, oh, yeah, it's that school where where they do whatever they want. Mm -hmm. Well, not really. <laughs> it is it is freedom within limits, right? Yeah. It's just like, you know, we're, we're not going to give you a driver's license and, and tell you to go off on the highway where you 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 know the rules, you know how to um, interact. And it's the same thing in the environment. And one of the simplest thing is that the environment itself kind of gives them feedback because for example for a classroom I had 25 children so ranging two and a half to six we were just two adults and there is the material is out on the shelves for those three years so the younger child who goes and takes something off the shelf that they have not yet had a lesson on the only thing we ask them is oh have you had a lesson and they know they haven't, they put it back on the shelf and they go to the work that they know that they can, right? So 
our our role as the guide is to really connect the child with the material with the with the work that we call it and it really takes them from you know very practical uh life experiences of you know cleaning up a spill sweeping tying bows, uh, cooking, all of this to the sensorial education. So all of the senses, visual, olfactory, uh, taste, everything, music. Then there is a whole language section and mathematics. And it's just the, the curriculum itself and the Montessori didactic material that she developed um, over her years and also with her son is just genius. Like, I wish I had learned mathematics <laughs> that way because it's very, for the young children, it's it's, it's very concrete. It's it's hands-on. It's, you know, and, and, and it's just beautiful. So there's that. Um, mixed ages I talked about. Uh, what else? Oh, Important, I think, and that differs with other maybe um, other kind of, you know, uh, educational philosophies, maybe such as Waldorf or things like that, is that Montessori for the first six years is very much based in reality. So there is very, very limited, if if not at all, kind of fantasy, uh, you know, animals that dress up in clothes and play instruments and things like that. It's really about the concrete because the young child just is trying to figure out where they've been born, right? And they just want concrete information. So we tend to avoid all of that until after six. And so that's, you know, that's a conversation and a conversation for another day because people say, oh, but, you know, uh, fantasy and imagination, their imagination blossoms from the concrete, right? And it's their imagination. We are not imposing adult imagination uh, onto them. So that's a, a big one. And then another thing that I think is really important and very different from conventional education is that there is freedom of movement. Yes. <laughs> and I think that is like a huge one. Huge. Especially with the younger children. They are in perpetual motion, right? To ask them to sit still at a desk is, is pure torture for them. So they are, you know, and we actually use movement in our lessons, right? I'm going to sit at the other end of the classroom and, and ask them to go get something at the other end so that there's a walking back and forth. And, and it's just, it's really part of it. There's even in our in our what we call primary classroom so that that two and a half to six there's a ellipse in the middle of the classroom where they can walk on the line mm -hmm. and that's often something that really calms them right yeah. they'll just go on their own and just walk and sometimes we can even you know balance and put something on our head or hold something like bells and we try not to make them ding i mean it's just you know it's a very much about um self-control and, and self-discipline. So it is, it is beautiful. Uh, but freedom in, of movement is to me very important. And then the other, I think, most important one is this idea of uninterrupted work cycles. So this is really because we know that the most brain activity happens when we are in flow, when we are focused and concentrated. So to interrupt a child, and, and I know in conventional education, it's done like every 20 minutes, we have to clean up and go to the next station or go to music or whatever. Well, I had three hours in the morning where we just let them be. So I was there to give one-on-one -on -one lessons to the child who needed one, who maybe the child who had a hard time choosing or, um, you know, just needed the, the the next challenge. But otherwise, the other children are, you know, either working together in very small groups or completely independently on their work. And that's why it is looks so peaceful and so quiet, because everybody is just focused on what they want to be doing. Nobody's telling them what to do. They are 
engaged in purposeful, intelligent work. Yep. And it is child led. And I think that's the piece of it that is so beautiful to me is that it really is driven by children. It's driven by their development, where their desires, their wants, their needs. So it actually mm-hmm. reminds me of the work of Ned Johnson and William Stixford. Um, they talk about the self-driven child. So Oh, yes, yes. So, and they talk, I I just uh, recently had him on the podcast and he was talking about the, you know, the ability to have that internal sort of motivation and how that really is so helpful mental health wise for children to be able to have, to be able to determine themselves what they want to do, how they want to spend their time, where they want to study, those sorts of things. And that really sounds like that's the core of Montessori at the beginning or little is what do they want to do? How do they want to spend their time? Yeah. And, you know, I've seen a lot of stuff on Instagram. I'm an Instagram girly. Um, and so sometimes I fall into these little um, rabbit holes all about um, Montessori at home. So okay. if somebody wanted to do incorporate some of these, um, these philosophies into their home, what would you suggest? Um, so I, I will answer that uh, right away, but I just wanted to f- close the loop with the educational because what you said about uh, Ned Johnson is one thing about the difference also with Montessori and conventional education. There are no grades. There is no yes. testing. Yeah. Okay. So we're just we're just seeing mastery of of skills, and we challenge them more and more and there's a whole sequence for you know the whole the whole gamut and we just we just you know built on the the mastery so just just wanted to close that loop so at home yes of course like um you know Montessori is definitely for me um adapted at home and I think sometimes we do this intuitively and and you know with instincts but uh, and for me, that's why I started my business is really I felt that the parents that were uh, that had their children in the Montessori school I worked at sometimes, you know, just were there because they had heard good things about Montessori or it was maybe in the neighborhood or or something. But, you know, it wasn't really like I'm seeking this philosophy and there was a disconnect sometime with home and school because in the Montessori prepared environment, the child is completely self-sufficient and independent. They can, you know, put on the, take their coat off, put it on a hanger, change shoes. If, you know, their clothes get wet, they change, they prepare their own food, they clean up all of this. So they're, they're, they're very confident there. And then they get picked up <laughs> and somebody else does all these things for them. And they get very frustrated because it's like, wait a minute, I can do this. Right. And especially those young children, they are at a stage where it's, you know, let me do it. Right. And, and actually a, a motto we have in Montessori is help me to do it by myself. Oh, that's right. I love that. <laughs> so that is what happens at home. Help me to do it by myself. So this is where I encourage parents to look at their environment and how they can adapt it. And remember, this is temporary. Your child is not going to be two forever, right? So they're not going to be crawling forever. It's 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 temporary. So the for me, the first maybe six to eight years, we are constantly evaluating, observing our environment and adapting it for them. And so this starts, you know, at infancy, uh, I have, you know, this whole thing about the the Montessori nursery, for example, where, um, you know, this is this is kind of um, uh, out of the box thinking, but for example, in a Montessori uh, room, in a bedroom, we don't use a crib. We use what we call a floor bed, which is again, trusting that the child will learn what the area of rest is 
And when they do start moving, they will be able to get on and get off and, and be self-sufficient. When they're tired, they know where to go. And when they're done, they get up and play with a toy that is that is in their room and they don't scream bloody murder of, you know, get me out of this crib. <laughs> so, you know, but it's 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 a it's a whole concept. So at home, um, and I encourage parents, you know, uh like parents of, of very young children, I say crawl around your home, see it from their perspective, right? Yeah. It's it's we are in a very adult centric uh, environment, all our artwork is, is up at our visual sense, like, lower some of it down, even like family photos for me down down low where they can see it. It's, it's intriguing. It's a beautiful way to share language to share family history, all of that, right. And then we want to look at the kitchen, like how can we help the child maybe get water on their own, or maybe, you know, prepare a small snack snack on their own. So it it is maybe a little bit more work on our part, because we have to think about it. And we have to maybe prep a few things. But the the end results of this confidence of this independence is is well worth it. Um, and I will, you know, I will say, one thing about the kind of um, trend that I feel Montessori is on these days, I would also be careful as to, you know, so, some of it is is what I see, at least on, on, you know, with my eyes on Instagram, some of it is like, ah, uh, it's a little goofy. Like, <laughs> no, it's, for me, it's like concrete, purposeful, intelligent work right? It's not about creating these goofy activities that, you know, you're you're going to go buy things that you don't really need or have in your home. Like, I would much rather that you bring your child into what you are already doing, right? In your in your daily chores, like make that part of their routine. Uh, you know, prepping food with a child is just so beneficial. They, they, they're developing all of their senses. They want to be connected. They want to be involved. They want to have significance and belonging. So instead of complaining, like I can't get dinner ready because my child always wants to be around me, take that as a really clear message that the child is saying, help me to do it by myself, involve me, get me involved. So even just, you know, give them a potato to scrub, that's, that's all that they need at different stages. And then slowly and surely, they'll be cooking dinner for you. So right, which is what know, we want invest. Them to do. <laughs> this is and that's, I think that's the thing. It, it's hard sometimes, especially when you're parenting the little ones. Mm hmm big picture. I want them to learn how to cook and be able to survive and do these things on their own. I, I'm trying to, I'm parenting them, which means I'm teaching them to be able to do these skills on their own. But it takes that, it takes the time when they're that little to pause, slow down and give them a potato and give, and you know, and exactly. It's and, the, and, the, and, and the thing is, is that, um, is that, at that young age, they are interested. Yes. <laughs> they are motivated. They want to do what they have been observing us do, right? That's that's their that's their only desire is to do what we're doing. So involve them when they are pulling at your <laughs> pants leg and involve them when they are still small and you think that they're not capable, give them, give them, you know, a developmentally appropriate task, but don't wait until they are capable because they have completely lost interest by then. <laughs> I think I always, when I think about Montessori, I think about the fact that my kids, when they were little, I had my son in daycare because he, I had to go back to work and I remember coming in and he was tiny. He was like not even one yet. And he was drinking from a cup. And I was like, 
how was he drinking from a cup? I had no idea, but they had been teaching him that at school. And I was like, oh, well, you can drink from a cup at home. Too. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I think, you know, unfortunately, the whole kind of baby industry has dumbed things down for our children. Children are so, so, so capable, like so capable, way beyond what we what we can think of. So, you know, yes, give them a cup from from, you know, the get go. Like, don't bother with the whole sippy cup thing, because the sippy cup, what is it? It's for us adults. So we don't need to change their shirt five times a day when they're drinking. But it's just a stage. It's just temporary. This is how they're going to learn. So, no, I find that so interesting. And here's here's what I uh, wanted to get a little bit more clarity from you. OK, about. so, you know, there's a lot of schools that can put Montessori in a name. Right. And there's a lot of, you know, to your point, like there's a lot of people who can put content out that says it's Montessori. How do you know if it is actually following the philosophies and especially when it comes to schools, like if you're looking at a school, this was, this was where I got a little bit nervous because I, what I read, I was reading some stuff about, you know, people can just like put Montessori in a name or they put Montessori in the name, but are they really following all the philosophy of Montessori that you discussed with us earlier? So what can right. you do as consumers, as people who are going out there and looking for things that are Montessori focused, how, like what, how can we judge? <laughs> right. So very, very good question. And, and yes, unfortunately, um, Montessori was never copyrighted because again, she was very much like, you know, it's just the child. <laughs> I didn't do anything. Look at the child. Right. So it was never copyrighted. So there are a few uh, accreditations. There's an international accreditation called AMI, so Association Montessori International, that she founded actually in 1929 with her son. Um, not all schools bother to go through the accreditation. And then there's also AMS in this country, in the U.S., uh, American Montessori Society. But yes, you know, Montessori was never copyrighted. So for me, you know, do do your homework. But there are a few red flags to watch out for, right? So first of all, I would say, and this I would say for any school, whether it's Montessori or not, like take the time and go observe. Like, please spend at least 20 minutes observing. Do these children seem happy? Are the adults communicating th with them with respect, right? Are they coming down to their level and having eye contact and so forth? So already there, I think your gut will tell you if this is a place for your child or not. But if we are specifically looking for Montessori, some of the red flags for me are there is no mixed age group. Oh, okay. Yeah. A, a school tour will tell you, oh, this is the two-year-old and the three-year-old and the pre-K and then this and that. It's like, no, <laughs> the whole concept. And she was very adamant about that. It's, it's, you know, it's for social skills. It's for uh, emotional intelligence. Like that mixed age group is important. So that's a red flag. And then the other one is uh, when there are a multitude of kind of extracurricular activities that are going to in interrupt that workflow. So it's not an interrupt, uninterrupted workflow, right? It's going to be a music teacher that's going to come in and, uh, you know, this or that. For me, like, there needs to be at least that two and a half, three hour, whether it's in the morning or in the afternoon, but that there, there's really this understanding about the flow and concentration. So that to me is really important. And then the other one is this freedom of choice. Like I have been in so-called Montessori schools where the adult is telling the child what area to go to and what work to choose. And to me, that is a lack of respect and, and, and totally not understanding the philosophy. And I actually, um, I had visited the school and I actually asked the director, I said, well, what about, you know, freedom of choice for, for the child? I noticed that the guide was telling, oh yeah, that doesn't work for us. 
<laughs> okay. Not Montessori well. then, I thought. <laughs> <laughs> then don't call yourself Montessori, right? Exactly. <laughs> because and, and to me, you know, and the other very important thing is the adults that are going to be in community with your children. Are they trained? Ah, uh, yeah. Do they understand the philosophy? Like, do they have training? And the and the Montessori training is intense. Uh, you know, it's it's a uh, we we have to learn how to use every piece of material. We practice on it and and so forth. And then there's a whole very you know in depth understanding of the philosophy. And we, uh, and it's actually, we call this the spiritual preparation of the adult, because it is really about preparing ourselves to be in the presence of divine little beings, and that we really take ourselves out of it, right? Our, our adult ego has to be left outside, where we are really there to follow the child, to really follow their needs and their curiosity and so forth. And for that to happen, we need to be prepared to do that because, you know, it can be hard sometimes. So. so oh my yeah. gosh, that makes so much sense. And it really is so respectful of the child as a human, as a person being in the world and being in the classroom, being in the space. Yes, I, yes. That's lovely. Oh my goodness. And to me, I mean, one, one, you know, as I mentioned, I kind of came into this later. So I had been in, you know, advertising and corporate and all this. And suddenly I was, <laughs> I always say I traded my, my um, private, you know, office for a stool in a classroom with 25 little humans. And it, it was, you know, it was, it was challenging at the beginning but and that's where I found uh, positive discipline as well to to help me uh, manage all of that. But one of the things that I remember that was a very important lesson in that spiritual preparation is to see the child, and this is true for for our own children at home, is to see the child as a new child each and every day. Yeah, because they are they're changing, they're evolving, they're developing so rapidly right so we can't we can't hold grudges like you know yes they kicked us yesterday but <laughs> today's a new day and we see them as this brand new divine little being that they are oh my goodness that's so lovely because, and we do it gives we need to give them that fresh start every single day every day and it's it's hard to do because real that hurt when I got kicked but <laughs> but what do we we have to do we have to walk through it and exactly our own stuff and be able to do that I I'm I'm so glad that I was able to have you on and we could really delve a little bit more into Montessori um if people want to learn more about you where should they go so my website is yourparentingmentor.com. Uh, so that's where all my things are or my podcast, The Art of Parenting. And that sounds wonderful. And so I always ask my guests one last question. What are your coping skills? How do you rest and recharge? Oof. Um, depending on the level. <laughs> uh walking nature is my my you know where I can resource myself I'm I feel very fortunate to live not too far from the ocean so a beach walk is is often very calming um I I'm also a, a theta healer I've done a theta healing um and so there's there's a beautiful meditation that um I can do that will really call me and kind of put me back to, you know, seeing myself as a new <laughs> being each and every day, right? Because we tend to be pretty hard on ourselves. Um, but I think that's, that's most of it. I think it's, it's really movement, movement and meditation, I think would be the two big ones. Oh, my goodness. Thank you so much for sharing. Walking is one of mine. I walk mm -hmm. around my neighborhood and it's nature walking in. Yes. Nature. That's, that is, that's mine. So I have Lot yeah. of move to a new place. So we have lots of big trees. And part of why I wanted to get this space is because I could 
actually just sit in my backyard in nature. I could walk around and just be in trees. It's so calming. And sometimes, sometimes it's as simple as taking your shoes and socks off and just going barefoot in your backyard and just like grounding, right? It's just, for me, it's so calming. That's literal grounding. You were connected. Yep, Yep, exactly. I love that. Um, Thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. Um, Mm -hmm. Thank you all for listening. If you like this podcast, please take a moment and share it with your friends and colleagues. And as always, don't forget about yourself. Take a few minutes, have a little fun and have an awesome day. Thank you so much. 